And um, we've kind of, of uh, already spoken about this, just about your, you know, 600K followers and, you you know, you're, you're not res- you're you're not in control of all of them, but that uh, you uh, use your power, uh, hard fought for power, your power on social media and your your army of followers to what do you call it pylons that you orchestrate pylons. I know. I just I just retweet bad takes. That's all I do. If someone comes out and says. Uh, you know, as Carrie Ed Lloyd did once. Uh, yeah, know, she was one of the people that he yeah, mentioned. She talked about bleeders. And the use of the word bleeders is very deliberate. They are, they are for some reason, I don't actually understand the, the thinking behind this, but they are trying to make the word woman, you know, they're trying to make it, I don't know what they're trying, they're trying to destroy it. You know, yeah. they're mm. trying to pretend that the word woman, fundamental word in our language, is somehow offensive. Which has worked its way into maternity care. Yes. So I um, got into some trouble because a journalist asked me for my opinion on a university that was teaching their midwifery students how to catheterize a penis because you're no longer a mother, wow. you're not a pregnant woman, you're a birthing parent. Because if trans women are women, in life and law, mm-hmm. then trans women can get pregnant, can't they? Because they're the same as me. And if I say they're different from me because, you know, they're male, then I am a hateful bigot. So in order for a university to be able to tow the line, then they have to go along with trans women or women, which means they need to have a module in a midwifery degree about how to catheterize a penis because they're Women They're too. assigned to queer theory, which yeah. says that there is no difference between a person who is male and me. And I, I that's clearly silly. So I said to the journalist that I wasn't the right person because you need an obstetrician or, you know, a midwife. But I know the person that wrote the paper that the university are misquoting. And because I said that, because I said this is inappropriate, what the university should be doing with their midwifery students is looking at what is going to happen to the trans identified females, the trans men who get pregnant, mm-hmm. who are on testosterone, whose uteruses have aged because of their use of the cross sex hormones in male levels. It affects your reproductive tract. It causes pain. That's why they have hysterectomies. It's not got anything to do with ha- making your body fit what your internal sense is. You can't see your uterus. Mm. But because it's there's this unusual cramping, painful thing, which tends to be triggered by orgasm. So they stop being able to be sexually active because it is crippling pain that will last for days. Wouldn't it be much more useful for the students to consider what will happen when an, a vagina that is atrophied because it's effectively menopausal is trying to have a baby's head go through it? We are going to see birth injuries of a, of a form that we've never seen before. And you're working Kenya, you know what fistula is like. Mm. The fistula will be the thin end of the wedge for some of these people. And by raising that, by saying it, then I am condemned. I am a hateful bigot that must be removed from my job from within the sceptic movement because some of the professional complaints that were put before me are from people who are involved in that. They did sterling work for homeopathy. But for this scientific, what should be a debate, who else is going to have the debate? If the sceptic movement won't touch it, then they have failed in their mission. They should be able to discuss anything. Do you think I'm going to say something Slightly controversial here. I, I hope it doesn't seem out of place <laughs> <laughs> in our discussion. But, I mean, great believer as I am in a democracy, part of the people, everybody matters. Do you think that when, um, you know, the, uh, the interweb and social media in, in particular really, really took off and everybody's opinion, I'm doing little winky uh, quotation marks, and everybody's opinion or thoughts or whatever on anything were given equal weight rather than anyone thinking, 
well, this person actually knows what they're talking about. Uh, they have experience, they have training, they have yeah. understanding. No, I'd rather listen to uh, Joanna from Basingstoke. Do you think that was when it all got really, I was going to say it started falling apart, but, you know, really got dangerous when we are, we're getting pseudo, you know, quasi-information yeah. from people who genuinely, in terms of fact, don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, well, you know, my, I get, like, one of the... I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen. People saying to people, why are you following Graham Linehan? He's a bigot. And the reply will be, is he? Oh, OK. And I'll be unfollowed by that person. You know, people are just just yeah. accepting... Guilt what, by association. Oh, yeah. Like in the crucible. Yeah, mm. yeah. But but also, um, I heard a very interesting. I'm, I'm reading a book actually called. Uh, Good grief! <laughs> oh. Called uh, del, uh, oh, what's it called actually? Del, 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 uh, what delusion of crowds or something like that? It's a kind of updated version of an old book about uh, mass delusions, and one of the fascinating so things, the Mandela effect kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. the dancing Douglas plague. Murray's. The what? Douglas Murray's. No, no, it's not him. It's got a similar title, but it's not. It's not Doug, Douglas's book. But um, uh, one of the things in it is that. Um, you know, the reason, one of the reasons why human beings have been so successful is because, you know, we would migrate to the Ecuadorian forest or something. And through learning from each other, we were able to build kayaks, which you needed to survive there. And they, these kind of, it's a survival part of our brain that we are able to copy other people, right? Then the internet comes along <laughs> and the internet starts disseminating bizarre ideas throughout the world at a sp at the speed of light and everyone is somehow for some reason suddenly adopting these ideas you know so what i think is it, it, the, at the root of this and maybe this answers a little bit of your question earlier about what can we do about this you know we we have never we've been we've had the internet now for like uh 23 years in terms of its current incarnation broadband you know, uh, like the iPhone only came out in 2007, which always blows oh, my mind. Yeah. yeah. And what's happening is that we have such an accelerated rate of novelty. And we have also this kind of hardwired thing into our brain that we should copy other people. That it's leading, it's, this is, it's just created this mass delusion. It's created a philosophy. Uh, you, again, you might call it a religion. It's grown out of, you know, it was, it was kind of cooked up in academia, European sex therapists. Then it went over to American academia. Then it went on to websites like Tumblr and Reddit and Twitter. And it just got disseminated like a plague. You know, it's, it's a plague. It's an idea. It's a mind plague. At the same time as we stopped teaching children about critical thinking and we, in schools. And we also, I heard a really interesting woman that had a psychology, she was a psychologist, and she said that the, the timing of this ties in with when we also stopped giving medals for win, winning in primary school at sports races. <laughs> so the kids were taught oh, if everyone's a winner, a winner. Yeah. you turn up and you win. And therefore they lose the opportunity which is a, a sort of time limited developmental space where you learn how to manage disappointment. Mm -hmm. You learn how to accept success mm -hmm. graciously. Somebody has to win, somebody has to be last. And if you don't learn those skills as a child, that life can be disappointing, then you get to be 35 when you're a civil servant in Holyrood and you think, well, that's not very nice because. Equality means we're all winners. Therefore, you remove my email to my MSP because it's got bad words in it. And this is a thing that happens. There are keywords which mean that citizens' communications are just removed from their elected representatives' inbox because we, Jimmy, that never lost, never learned that sometimes life isn't very fair. Do you know? About I think she's got. I think she's right. Do you, Do you know about? Um the Denton's document. Have you ever heard of this? Denton? Yes. Tell us. Is this too what? No, I'm just, I'm like, yeah. Opening up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, are brilliant. we going to go there? Yeah, no, this is not I'm delighted. Shocking, but this is like another kind of mind-blowing. Uh, uh, there was a, there's a law firm called Denton's and they. A uh, global. Global, yeah. Biggest law firm in the world. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. 
Whoa. Wow. And they published a uh, guide for how to install unpopular policies in uh, a country or whatever, in a political process. Um, and the advice was basically given because they wanted to pass a law that said that parents could neither be consulted or even know about a child's gender change. They wanted to pass that law. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they had a number of a list of things that you should that trans rights activists should do to ensure that an unpopular law gets passed. And this was in the 90s. Oh, no, I think it was wasn't it in the 20s. No, it would have been in the 20s. No, no, it was recent. It was recent. It was written was it? by a tr trans rights activist. And this is children of any age. Yes. Yes. And, and it happened. There's um, many cases. Um, there's a, a very difficult situation in Edinburgh where a school transitioned a child without their parents knowing. Yeah. How can they do that? Because the child turns up in school, the school gives the child the other uniform and they use the other name and they use preferred pronouns and then the child gets changed before they go home to go back to their family who don't know that it's happening. So, first okay. of all, In incredibly Scotland. dangerous situation for safeguarding. You do not keep secrets from parents of children. You know, that's the first thing. Second thing is the list of things they suggested to these trans rights activists. They had things like uh, avoid the media, avoid <laughs> public discussion of this issue, uh, focus on uh, background lobbying. And influence, and they made it made it specifically clear. And I always think about Mary Black with this: uh, uh, target young politicians. So there's a lit. And have you ever heard of a civil rights movement that has been told to avoid the media? You know. So my, the, as I say, I know I know people disagree with my methods and so on, but I genuinely think that this is. The, the most evil movement we've seen in years. I'm not saying everyone involved in it is evil. Mm. I'm saying that as an ideology, it's evil. As 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 uh, uh, as you said, uh, Elaine, you don't tell children they were born in the wrong body because they will believe you. It is mm. a shocking thing that we have got to this state. Not only that we got to this state, but teachers are dressing the kids in different uniforms when we get to school. How have we got that far? And they have removed parental responsibility. When you have a child, then you have in law a responsibility to that infant for the next 18 years. And an education establishment has removed your rights and your responsibilities because they think they know better. And it's hard to talk about because now that you're talking about the Denton's document, it's a conspiracy theory level of discussion. Mm. You sound batshit. Yeah. You mm. can't talk about this down the stand or, or any no. comedy club in the whole of the city without sounding like you maybe need a wee bit of an intervention and, and to sit down and take a deep breath. And, and part but these of that, things are factually correct. Part of that is because the Liberal press just will not report on it. Because but, they're afraid mm. of the consequences because they get piled on and cancelled like you did. But still, I still find it extraordinary that The Guardian... Uh, like, a Guardian readers do not know about the Tavistock and Mermaids. They just have no clue. But that they, any of that's they going now on. know that you are not anti-trans, that you are gender critical, as of yesterday. Yeah. They oh, started, hello. They Tell started, us more. Well, no, they've, they've, they've kind of... There's been a bit of a, a, an interesting change in tone to some of the pieces. Because every time I was mentioned, they would call me anti-trans. And I would complain about it. And then they would say, well, no, it says it on your Wikipedia page. <laughs> so you can't complain. <laughs> I'm like, you know, well, you know, and I, and I just gave up after a while. But recently, it just seems to me that people are now saying, you know, women's rights campaigner, you know, which is, thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Finally. Yeah. You know, in my case, being anti-trans seems to mean that I would prefer for these people to have evidence based information that drives their care. I mm. want them to be experimented on. And I, I wouldn't even call it an experiment because if you have an experiment, you have a theory. You have yeah. a hypothesis that you're trying to disprove and that's not what this is. The people that I have met in clinic, that because this is my, like I do have a bias because the people that have come to clinic because they have problems post genital surgery, they've not had a happy outcome. That's why they're in clinic. But 
there are a lot of people making a lot of money. And that is something that feeds into the politics because Liberal Democrats got a million quid. Mm -hmm. How much money? A million point four. From a pharmaceutical company that makes the medication that is a puberty blocker that has been banned in many, many countries with the exception of America because we don't mind an experiment just mm. on children. If you do, if you give a, a kid that's autistic a puberty blocker, you make them infertile. So what we're doing is stopping people with neurodiversity from having children. Mm. And to go back that's to your, your analogy, in the 30s, there was a name for stopping people that you perceive to have a difference from having children. And I, as a member of a professional body, I'm supposed to be okay with this. And I'm not. It's such a massive subject, which I, I think is most publicly being uh, debated, I will grace it with that, by people who actually know almost nothing. Uh -huh. but, but of course, I mean, this is about... This is about gender, this is about who you are, this is about how you are. And right now it seems like at one of the most vulnerable times of your life and a time when peer pressure trumps just about everything. So we have, one way or another, we've got to find a better way well, what to you just said about, talk about it. About who you are is key. If these people are gender non-conforming, do that. Why do you need to have a double mistectomy in order to be gender non-conforming? Yeah, I, mean, I can't understand that. And I've been asking for, since the fuss last year in the Fringe, um, I want to be wrong. Please show me where I'm wrong. That's what I've been using Twitter for. Mm. The people that are abusing me, go and give me the evidence. I would love to find a reference that I can go, oh, I missed that one. I'm really sorry. And I'll repent. Yeah. In a year, nobody's I mean, done that. I'm not wrong. If there was, if there were, sorry, um, so <laughs> grammar Nazi, <laughs> if there were suddenly out of the blue some kind of um, irrefutable proof that uh, you were wrong. Mm hmm. What would you do? <laughs> I'd be extremely embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, one of the things that trans rights activists say, say to us all the time is uh, educate yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you know that you're going, if, as soon as you enter into this debate, you're going to get attacked from all sides. Mm -hmm. You do have to do that. You educate yourself. So before I started talking about this in any way, I really looked into it, you know, and I just had to make double sure because there were some arguments that used to make me, um, that used to sway me a little bit. I remember one that I actually was fooled by <laughs> was, um, no, there's always been trans people. They're just more confident now. You know, and it's like, oh, OK, so, yeah, oh, well, that makes sense. And that made sense to me for about five minutes until I realized, well, where are they all in literature? And and, you know, they 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 kind of um, try and go back into the past and trans figures like any if you were a woman with short hair like Joan of Arc, you're trans, you yeah. know, and they rob women of these figures, you know, with this nonsense. And so I just kind of started every argument I heard. I really tested it. I bounced it against the wall many times and thought, is there anything I'm missing? And there's not. There's not. No one. And the other thing is that people just do not want to think about this. So they don't put that kind of thought into it. You know? But there shouldn't be shame in being wrong. Like yeah. the aeronautical industry have this principle of um, if a pilot makes an error, you have to, and people die because they fly the plane into the Alps, then you have to look at what happened. You look at the standard operating procedures for that aeroplane and they analyse the incident uh, without shame because they need to solve the problem to stop it from happening again. And then medicine adopted that. It's okay to be wrong. You mm. just have to communicate it so that other people don't land up in the same situation. Well, when I when I uh, came back to Twitter, my I changed my bio for a while to um, I, I reserved the right to not agree with anything I said before 2018. Because like when when I got into this fight, I suddenly realized that 
I suddenly thought, well, if they're lying to me about this, and if they're lying that I'm a bigot, and if they're lying that Elaine is a bigot, and all my friends are bigots, then what else are they lying to me about? And I started looking at other issues, and I'm not a, uh, I'm, you know, people call me a climate change denier, because I, I, I made this point in a different podcast, and a COVID denier. My point is this, if you confuse people by telling them fundamental untruths like men can turn into women then they will not trust you ever again you, you we we are looking down the barrel of real social unrest because covid did turn out to be there were things people didn't know and as you say uh, elaine people got things wrong you know there has to be as you say a, for, a forgiveness for that but there won't be any forgiveness if people stick to a mm. harmful position despite all the evidence showing they're wrong and i really worry that someday you know it's just going to explode in social unrest you know <laughs> well, that would be a terrible place to end it no actually i think that'd be a that'd be quite a good <laughs> place to end it. what what would you do to stop that happening if you could adults in the room that's all we need. We need politicians to do their jobs. We need uh, journalists to, to write about this. Like one of the reasons why I'm seen as frenzied and, and, and whatever else. Because you are, to be fair, a bit frenzied. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, it's because no one else is doing the job that mm. I, I'm across. Like I'm, my website is now the one of the few places. There's, there's a few more now. But, but when I started it, no one else was covering these issues. And I was. We, and we, when was that? 2019, something like that. No, when was it banned from Twitter? 2020, 2020 or something like that. But, um, but you know, there was so much news coming in of these outrageous stories that luckily I have this wonderful uh, associate called JL and she, she collects them every week in a, in a, on a webpage called The War on Women, you know. I just couldn't keep up with it. And I still, even with her doing that brilliant job, I still can't keep up with it. There's so much happening every single second. You know, every day there's there's another story of the of the tragic results of these of these beliefs. And you know, I, I will calm down when journalists start doing their jobs mm. and start covering it. One thing that I I I do want to ask is before all of this happened. Your writing and your, you know, Father Ted, all those, it was just the most beautiful, kind of whimsical, gentle, just wonderful stuff. I keep wanting to say, you know, whimsy, but, hmm. and, and lines that everybody remembers and, and none of them were remotely, it's all, is it? small or is it mm. very far mm. away it it's almost on a level with the python quotes that you just you remember it immediately and you can picture the two of them at the window and are you a different person to the person who wrote that to the person who wrote that not really no i mean i mean my if anyone saw the comedy that i'm doing it's like silly jokes about ordering pizzas and getting stoned and you know, watching Netflix, you know, it's, it's like silly stuff. And do you enjoy, because again, just, uh, you know, looking through Twitter and all the stuff and things on telly and, uh, you know, I, I, I feel for it because it's, it reminds me of me, you know, going off on one, you know, kind of like something of just, to use a, a modern word, trigger, but you know, you you go off on one and the, the press will leap on that with glee. But um, I, it would be catast it would be tragic if that all that gentleness mm. disappeared. And so That's do, you, a, yeah. do you do you uh, you know sacrificed on the altar of social media? Um, well I would do say you, on the altar of women's rights. Okay. Okay. <laughs> do you do you enjoy the stand up and the stand up? Do you enjoy doing stand up? And you're not like any other um, open spot act. Where is there for you to go? Well, yeah. I mean, the thing about 
stand up. We were just talking about this today. Uh, it's a young man's game. You know, I don't think I'm... Oh, away you go. The young people have nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean in terms of the energy you need uh, right. to do spots three times a week and really develop uh, your your kind of uh, sixth sense about performing. Mm-hmm. I, I can't be arsed. <laughs> it's too hard. I'm too old. It's not going to happen that way. So what I've been, what's been very useful about doing it in a very straight, trying to memorise an act, trying to do it yeah. way, is I've discovered... I don't want to do it like that. I, I think I would much rather do it the way you did your show, Elaine, where you have a laptop open, you have props, and you're just kind of having a nice, normal discussion with the audience. I think that's... Sorry, well, I hope I'm not undervaluing what you did. No, I'm, just, very funny. I'm just laughing because you're looking for a reasonable adjustment for your menopause. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so I think I would like to start thinking... I've, been, I've just actually got a, a text from someone today asking me if I'd like to do three nights in some huge venue. Go on, go Whoa. on, go on. Yeah. Go on, go on, go on. So I, but, but I would like to do that, but I, but I tell you what, there's no way I'm going to memorise a list of jokes and try and do that in front of a big audience. It's got to be more like a conversation and a mm-hmm. kind of... So I'm going to see, I'm going to look into how I can do that, you know. But I do like, I love audiences. I'm, I'm you know, when I'm not doing stand-up and I'm in, front of, I'm in front of an audience, I'm fine. I can make people laugh. I can, I, you know... It, it's it's I'm absolutely fine when I'm doing stand up. Just I just look like I'm just sweat. I've never done a stand up gig where I haven't been sweating out of every pore. You know, it's like I'm in deliverance. Yeah, but you're what seven gigs in? That's normal. No, sure, but I don't mean sweating from fear. I just mean for some reason my body says time to sweat. Yeah, you know, and uh, and I just and I get up there and I and it's just coming out of my head. I'm worried that people are going. Is he going to die? You know, <laughs> is he on cold? <laughs> it's young yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, not since I left the television industry, uh, but uh, but yeah. So so it's a it's an interesting um, discipline, and I'm, yep. I'm really enjoying getting getting a handle on it and seeing what makes because it's very different to writing a, a joke in a sitcom. You know, it's it seems to be very very neatly structured in terms of. Um, in terms of uh, uh, setup and payoff, or premise and setup yeah. and payoff, I'll tell you a funny thing though. I have this joke, and it goes, uh, it goes. Uh, I'm very famously divorced, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not letting my, everything go to seed. Uh, you know, for instance, I like to keep my flat clean. You wouldn't uh, want to rub a white glove over any of the surfaces, but you know, I do pretty well. Although the other day, I was, had a very embarrassing experience when uh, I had a woman back, and she went to the toilet. And there was still a poo in the bath. <laughs> so, like, but but what I did then, I did one gig. I did one gig and I forgot the white glove. <laughs> so it just looked like I was admitting to being an animal. <laughs> and, you know, you do something like that and you wonder, why didn't they laugh? They all looked a bit disoriented and confused as to why I was admitting to this. And then I realised later, I forgot the white glove. No, I never forget the white glove. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Elaine, you're not doing a show this fringe? No, no, I'm not because you have to sign up by January at that time. I thought I was going to be in court. So I thought right. probably best not devote my time to a show, but I'm going to do a show next year. Cool. Uh, might you, after the, uh, the strange and uh, combative but ultimately successful uh, foray into stand-up this year. You, would you come back next year? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how things are going. It's, uh, you know, we keep thinking, surely this can't last much longer. But it Depends seems if to, you can find a venue, Graham. Well, that's what I mean. It seems to draw on and on. And it's but one of the other reasons I'm in this fight is because I, I'm not going to be able to earn a living until, until this ideology is destroyed. It's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you nobody will... No. You know the Father Ted musical? It is completely ready to go. It is. The songs are written. We rehearsed it. We did dance routines. We have it ready to go. And they're just sitting on it. And the last letter I wrote to Hattrick Productions, to Jimmy Mulville, <laughs> said, listen, stop asking me to stop doing this fight. I cannot stop it. My daughter's future is in the balance. Mm. I cannot betray my daughter. The next time I saw them, they offered me £200,000 to walk away from the show. So, you know. Do you have a co-writer on it? Uh, yeah, Arthur was on it. And Neil Hannon and Paul mm. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, I realised 
after that meeting that they must have given their their uh, consent to, 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 to Robert Popper, who was the commissioner, Tom mm, Ford, who was a brilliant right. comedy writer himself. He said, if you write a show, it could be on next year. And I thought, Whoa, oh, yes, of course. And I, I you know, and I, I you know, it, it made me start to think about ideas, you know. And luckily, I had a lap, I had a PC that simply would not work. And I kept <laughs> meeting these strange guys around my house. Mm-hmm. One guy came once and he knocked on the door and my wife opened it. And I'd spoken to him on the phone, but my but he didn't know about my wife. So instead of saying, oh, hello, is Graham there? He said, you're not Graham. <laughs> and uh, he came up and he was sitting beside me while we were fixing the computer. And I said, uh, why don't more people come out, come around fixing computers in, in people's houses? It's not really done a lot because they don't have, they don't have the people skills. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, boom. So the two things of Robert Popper saying we'd look like a sitcom and, uh, and also those kind of people I was meeting and also knowing that I wanted to work with Richard Ayoetti somehow, those three things came together. At the moment, no one's asking me for anything. Although I have had a few, it's been interesting. I'm getting a few more letters and, and you know. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if, if you could, and I know I asked this uh, earlier, but if you could, if you could turn back time, it, it, would you? Would I do everything a different? I don't know. Do everything no, a different I, like way. My, I am. I am more proud. I am as proud of this as I am of Father Ted. And Father Ted is the other thing in my life that I'm. That I just think uh, I could. That'll probably be written on my gravestone. But this, this fight, I've never been involved in anything more important. You know and. You know, I can't really do comedy when I feel that the women in my life are in trouble, you know. And and so, you know, I just need, again, though, I don't need to be always on it. I don't need to be always fighting it. I would love it if I could take a step back and people, but I need people to come forward, Mm -hmm. you know. And once I do, once they do, you know, uh, you'll see me, you'll see me, uh, you'll see a very different person, you know. I look forward to that. <laughs> well, well, I don't mean you didn't this, like this one. No, it's, I don't, that's, I just, well, that sounded terrible. But it, I, it would be good for you. Sure, I'm you not, could have I'm fun. Not, this is not uh, adding to my my life expectations. You know, this is not doing very good for me. What's going on? You know, it's uh, lonely and it's it's uh, stressful and it's uh, uh, it's hard on me. You know, but like like. I've just come off anti-anxiety medication and, you know, finding it, it once again quite hard to sleep because I lie in bed going, fucking <laughs> better. Um, but, uh, but, you know, things do seem to be easing off a little bit. More people are getting in touch. More people are beginning to see what I'm going through. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I'm hoping that maybe next year we can come back and we can have a completely different conversation. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank coming you. in to have a talk. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks very much. Uh, this is normally the point where I say, tell us where your show is on, but there's no point of that. But no, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Thank you both Thank so you. much. Thanks for speaking to us. Yeah.